sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of BC. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. Healthcare. Healthcare is probably the thing that eats up uh, most of the budgets of any government in Canada by about 50%. It's probably the largest industry in our nation. But we have to ask ourselves a lot of questions. Uh, who decides what healthcare really is? Who decides what the future of healthcare is? What the research is? And when we discover things and finally put them into action, who decides how we're going to implement them and how they get used? Uh, is it only folks in lab coats? Is it only professors? Is it only doctors and nurses? What about those odd people called, excuse me, patients or consumers or citizens? <laughs> well, we have a couple of folks here who are trying to change that face because they are now helping to add the voices of patients to the healthcare formula. And I'm delighted to welcome to our studios today Bev Holmes, who is with uh, the Michael Smith Foundation, and uh, Colleen McGavin, uh, who is a volunteer for Patient Voices Network. Not CA. That's yeah, right. Patient Voices N Network, PVN. Yes. So thank you so much for thank coming you. here. Uh, Bev, let's, let's start with you. What's it all about? How did this start? Who, who got it going? Let's, uh, I'll give you just a little bit of history Please. on the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research. Yeah. So we were started in 2001 with uh, a grant from the provincial government, a $110 million grant. And the reason that the foundation was started is that BC was really lagging behind other provinces in its ability to attract and retain health researchers. So in order, to, in order to make discoveries and to put them into action for patients, we actually need to maintain a base of excellent health researchers. We have to support them to succeed, to discover, and to bring money into the province. And it didn't hurt that we had a Nobel Prize winner. Exactly. Dr. Yeah. Michael Smith, who yeah. won the uh, Nobel Prize in 1993. Um, unfortunately, he died before the foundation began. He died in 2000. In 2001, we were started. So our initial work was really about supporting star researchers as well as trainee researchers to build really strong research programs in British Columbia. And we had people like Michael Ling, Ling's name, oh Victor, Victor, Victor Ling, Ling yeah, like Victor yeah. Ling in yeah. the cancer yes. area who made a point yeah. of finding people like this and bringing them here. Absolutely. Yes? Yeah. We have lots of recruitment to BC and there's a number of areas in which we're very, very strong. And we actually still fund a lot of researchers, both established researchers and trainees, but increasingly, agencies like ours, and they exist in, in all the provinces, we're starting to look at not only funding people to make discoveries, but actually to apply the discoveries. So now that we, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So now that we actually know what's happening here, how do we put it into action for the, for the betterment of patient care and also for the economy? Let's, let's get the health system better, let's get people better, let's get our economy better. And so that's what, the, the, really there's a shift in thinking about what are the drivers of research? And yes. as you mentioned, they are research funders, government, and researchers. And, you know, as we said, as Colleen and I pointed out in the article we wrote for the Vancouver Sun, of course these people are all working on behalf of the public. Yes. But it's time to get the public more involved directly. So we're um, happy to be participating in an initiative from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which is called the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. Right. And this is what Colleen is a volunteer in. So, so Colleen, uh, how do we get people involved? You've got this... Uh, patientvoices.ca and, and people can look at it and swim around in it. But, but let's say that I, I want to do something. I want to be involved. What do I do? Oh, well, if you want to be involved, yeah. it's, it's fairly easy. Yeah. <laughs> Go to the website, yeah. patientvoices.ca. Uh, you'll learn all about it there. But I mean, basically, that's a, a program that's yes. been set up by an organization called Impact BC, right. which came out of uh, a movement by the Ministry of Health 
called patients as partners. So the whole idea was we want to get patients more involved, bring their voice into not only health care but now health research as well, believing that the patient voice is what is going to really make a profound difference. G give me an example of how uh, any, you don't have to name a patient, you don't blow anybody's anonymity here, but how has any patient been able to sort of refract or, 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 or just move the dial over a bit? Oh. What do we hear from patients that suddenly have scientists going, oh, that's interesting, mm -hmm. I didn't sure. think about that moment. Sure, well in the, in the realm of healthcare delivery, Patients are the ones who, who see the, the whole system, the system as a whole. So yes. when we're asked by healthcare partners or providers to sit down with them in focus groups or at their meetings or on committees or something, we bring that perspective of our whole journey. They're usually pretty interested in their own particular area, their little sure. silo, what their specialty is or whatever. So right. I believe that the patient perspective is really bringing that, that fuller picture and, and also really grounding their work. Like, in give me the, a real, in the, in the give patient me, stories. Yeah, give me, you know, give me a story. Give me a tangible example. I want to hear. I want to hear how somebody has affected this process. Uh, somebody who has affected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I, I think I could point to what we're doing with uh, with the strategy for patient oriented research yes. right now. I mean, insofar as there are two of us now, who are who were brought on board to be part of this. We're um, part of the interim governing council that it looks reviews. The development of a business plan for this strategy, and uh, I, I truly believe we're making a difference at the table, bringing our voice, our perspectives, our validation of this idea that we we need to bring patients into the picture. Let's talk about health research in things like determining what what are the priorities for the research, what are the actual questions that we want to have asked. Yes. How how should we uh, you know get the data that we that we need to make the decisions that we you know, now I have two pieces of anecdotal information that are that are yelling in my head <laughs> that, that is that, that present a challenge. One is that uh, I have a friend who became a famous comedian, and he used to do a joke, "MD, me doctor." Yes. And the other is that I have a friend who said, "Advise me, never date a doctor." And I said, "Why is that?" Be, she said, because doctors think they're God and they forget when they come home they're just a guy having a sandwich, yeah, you know. Right, yeah. So my, my question is, do, do, how is the health system adjusting to listening to patients? Uh, you know, do the scientists and researchers really want to hear what patients have to say? I think we're talking about a huge culture shift here. Yes. And when culture shifts happen at the national and provincial levels, they're they're much easier to buy into because uh -huh. they're ju they're just bigger. So we're talking about a sea change, and we're also talking about uh, money, which also helps, which is offered by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research and matched by provincial. Um, money uh, to actually set up a, what's called a support unit for patient-oriented research. So again, this is about identifying questions that are of interest to patients and healthcare providers and decision makers and policy makers and implementing research that will make a difference. In great, uh, Bev, the great uh, uh, community organizer Saul Linsky, who, who did most of his work out of Chicago and, and, and Rochester, New York, he used to say that power only changes when we point out to power that it'll mm -hmm. cost more not to change. What incentive is there to me if I'm doing stem cell research mm -hmm. or I'm doing uh, uh, oncology or something to listen to some schlep yeah. off the street? Why do I want to listen to this person? Yeah, very good point. <laughs> and and I, I, I have to come back again to this whole idea of a provincial notion because I, I'm sure that if we talk to many researchers, they would say, patients are great, let's have them at a committee meeting. And then, and then that patient comes to a committee meeting, but nothing is ever really... Uh, determined based on his or her input, which is actually, by the way, one of the biggest barriers to people not wanting to get involved. Yes. They don't necessarily believe that anything will change based on their input. However, when you have the idea of a provincial strategy, you start looking at what needs to change. You actually need to get research universities and funders and so on to change their policies so that involving the public and patients simply becomes the way we do things. Uh -huh. You also have to offer training. So, And we're not talking about just training of, of patients Patients. We're talking about training of researchers and yes. healthcare professionals so that they actually know how to work with patients. So I was just going to mention on the incentive issue that um, uh, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research out of Ottawa has yes. provided a fantastic incentive in so far as they've 
they've uh, developed this strategy that, and they put it out to the provinces. We want you to develop these support units and we're providing a lot of funding to do that. But what we want to see is that you're bringing the patient into the picture. So we're, we're building support units for what is called patient-oriented research. So that specifically means a research where patients are integrally involved in the whole process. So we consult, uh, provide ideas for, for research questions. When you, when you mentioned the Canadian Institute of Health priorities. Research, I, I, I find myself suddenly thinking about my visits to Rockland, Maryland, and uh, NIH, National Institute of Health yes. in, oh. in America. Yeah. So if I'm not mistaken, America and Great Britain have, have had similar initiatives in, in, in recent years? Yes. Well, actually, for a long time, oh. I think that we're. Ca it's. I mean, it's not fair to say that there's nothing happening in British Columbia because individually, there's lots of researchers who are involving patients. Yes. But in the in the UK, there's an organization called Involve, and for almost 20 years, they've had a huge public involvement um, uh, component to their national institutes of health research. It's a wonderful website if people want to visit visit it. It's uh, invo.org.uk, yes. and they've got a great campaign called Research Changed My Life, which is all sorts of stories about how the public and patients have become involved in research. So, you know, uh, Colleen and our other volunteer are really taking um, advice from what's already been going on for many years. And yes. as you mentioned, the National Institutes for Health, uh, they also have um, public representatives on their highest of governing councils. There's another organization called PACOR, the yes. Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute in the United States that involves patients. Uh, I think in I had a Bacori recently, and I like the hot. Yeah, I, I know. I, I like the hot mustard hungry. on it. Makes yeah. you hungry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I was going to say also on the whole uh, subject of incentives. I think yes. um, so. Impact BC's program, Patient Voices Network, has about a four-year history in the province now, and as patients have been brought in to work with healthcare partners. I think that there's momentum building. People are hearing that this is productive. This is helping. And so there, there are greater incentives. There's more people wanting to get on board, wanting to try this out. And Gosh, the next thing you know, patient, I mean, citizens will be involved in government. Wow, what a concept. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Well, what I mean, I, I, yeah. uh, the other representative on the yeah. interim governing council, I mean, we are in a sense involved in government yeah. of this initiative. Yeah. Uh, if you had your druthers, now that you've been involved for a little while, you had a magic wand, what would you, what would you want to see happen? In health research or health delivery? You, you pick one. Either. <laughs> um, well, I would like to see a system that is more patient-oriented rather than provider-centric, if you can yeah, like, get an idea like what? of what give I'm it, talking like, about what? here. Give well, me an example. Like, what? I'm a heart patient, so you pick pick something cardio, sure. and I might be able well, to identify with some, it. You know, where there's yeah. emphasis placed on what really, really matters to to patients, yes. and that's not always what matters to the providers. Um, can I give an example of the uh, osteoarthritis study? That of we, course, uh, absolutely. So that's within yeah. the context of both health research and healthcare. There's one study that where. Um, they, they, they learned that what patients wanted studied in health yes. research was things like surgical interventions and physiotherapy and that sort of thing. But 80% of the research dollars were being spent on pharmaceuticals. Ouch. So there's disconnect. A, a dis, you know, major, an dis, that, major that disconnect. That and I would think, uh, we have to take a break in just a second, I would think that that would be a huge issue across the board, across the scientific board, because pharmaceuticals, big pharma, owns so much of the territory mm -hmm. and can dictate so, so much. All right, we're going to take a little uh, breather. We'll be back in a moment, folks. Just give you an opportunity to say hello to us at davidburner.com and a chance for the lovely folks who sponsor this show to say hello to you here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. Back in just a sec. This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of BC. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery, that works. Is it 
possible? Is it possible that bus drivers and baristas could be telling a research scientist, <laughs> this is what you should be focusing on, folks? In particular, don't worry about finding the magic pill. Maybe there's other things that might work for me. Uh, Bev Holmes is with uh, the Michael, Michael Smith, Smith Foundation, and Colleen McGavin is a volunteer with Patient Voices uh, Network, the Patient Correct. Voices yeah. Network. So, yeah, that's a good example, just before we went to break. Osteoporosis, people are saying, yeah, it's not necessarily a pill that we need, but we want to, you know, what else can we do in terms of physio, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah. A, the, yeah. That, that's a very good example. What, what are you hearing from some of the people who are joining up? What are, you, what are you hearing from volunteers and people who are signing up? Why do people choose this? It's to, always in, choose to do this. To become involved yes, in something yes. like Patient Voices Network. Well, I think there's a wide variety of reasons. I guess I could speak to my own reasons. Please. Um, I personally had to retire from my job uh, yes. due to health issues early. Oh. I retired early. And, uh, you know, there was a, a need in me to yes. continue to do some sort of meaningful work. And yes. I became aware of this organization, Patient Voices If you Network. have a health issue, Colleen, you're disguising it admirably. Oh, uh, thank you. Because yeah. <laughs> you look great. <laughs> thank you. No, yeah. I, I've been, you know, that's that's been, uh, I've been doing very well in that good, regard lately. Good, good. Glad uh, to hear it. Yeah, but it was a 10-year journey, so I learned oh, a lot gosh. about how, how the healthcare system works. And You see, that's a very interesting thing you just raised. It's a 10-year journey. For so many people, once we get into the system, it's like we're in this big tunnel under a stadium, mm -hmm. right? And there's this, this, this other world called the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. and, and it's completely different from everything you experience until you start that journey. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And, and the, you know, uh, I was thinking about how, you know, I said earlier that we want the system to become more patient-oriented. Uh, the system that we have today, I think, is, is very oriented towards acute care. Yes. But there are, you know, what sort of epi chronic? episodic, yeah. you know, yes. I, I get sick, I get diagnosed, I get treated, I get fixed, and I come out the other end, and hopefully that all happens within a fairly short range of time. But, you know, as we baby boomers age, Increasingly, that's not the story. The story is, I get sick with one thing, then I get sick with something else, and then it gets complicated by X, Y, and Z, and so as I yes. move through the system, and so the system needs to keep up with that. And so I think that's one of the ways that, that we can bring our voice to the system and say, hey, we need to, we need to, uh, we need to think about this and we need to solve Well, responding, responding largely to acute care is really like police work. It's like being the detective after the murderer isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's understandable. Yeah. Someone falls over on the street, sure. we react, sure. right? But, but when someone just has a whole bunch of slow gathering symptoms, it's very easy to mistakenly say, well, have an aspirin, relax, you know, whatever, you're worrying too much. Sure. Another big uh, area of work that Impact BC does with patients as partners is on uh, chronic disease and chronic care self-management. So uh -huh. in talking about patients as partners, it's not just bringing patients into the picture in terms of having our input to issues like health research and so on, yeah. but it's making patients partners in their own health care and uh, learning how to manage the illness on an ongoing basis. There's so, many subtle, there's so many subtleties in this. You know, I've had two uh, minor heart operations, not, not uh, you know, open heart, but angioplasties, and they were four or five years apart. And I can tell you, both times, the service was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But the second time, the whole level had been raised. The operating theater was better. Mm. The work was better. The wrap-up was better. Instead of bleeding like a stuck pig from this, from this entry wound, now they plugged it with collagen. I mean, this was a whole new thing. In four or five years, right. the whole delivery had changed. Mm -hmm. You know, Then, on, on the day after, the doctors are all hovering around and discussing whatever's going on. And, and they're saying, we want to keep you for another night. And I said, no, I can't get better in this room. I have to go home. Right? right? Interesting. <laughs> but, but so they say, well, we got to check your, whatever it's called, I forget the, tri I forgot the word, troponin, the troponin level in your, in your heart. It's an enzyme that tells you whether or not you're having a heart attack. We'll do another blood test, and if the number goes down, you can go home. I said, the number's going down, trust me. So they sent me home. Mm -hmm. But do patients even know that they can have that exactly. conversation? Right. Do patients know they have the right? Yes. And the duty to sort of add their own. Yeah, yeah. Well, 
again, I guess we're getting away a little bit from the subject of health research, but um, another another program run yes. out of uh, the same area, Impact BC, is, a, is an educational program called Talking with Your Doctor and Other Healthcare Providers, uh -huh. trying to make patients um, better at being able to talk yes. with their doctor constructively, bringing their concerns, their co questions, knowing how to ask questions when they're not clear and so on. So that whole idea of empowering patients, mm -hmm. which I think is connected mm -hmm. to the... And where were we, we, I think, were you and I talking about the whole a, a, a potential campaign, or it was a campaign, uh, challenging patients to actually ask their doctors, have you washed your hands? Oh. And I remember thinking... Oh, how rude! I can think of a lot of people <laughs> who would never yeah. think to do that, yes. but perhaps we should be. We know that we, there's evidence to suggest that physicians should be washing their hands before they lay them on patients. <laughs> uh, yes, but it's kind of shocking to think that we'd have to ask. Well, yeah. well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you may have to. Give me, again, your best scenarios. We just have a few minutes left. Uh, what do you think is going to happen as we go down the road here? Well, I think what we're going to do is develop a strategy for public or patient involvement in health research in BC. And we'll actually be looking at uh, three things. We'll be looking at how we actually um, uh, create a cohesive, maybe a walk-in point for people. So people actually have an understanding of where they can participate and how. So that's one thing. The second thing that we want to do is actually as we mentioned earlier, build their capacity. How do we actually make sure that patients and the public feel like they are able to be involved and that researchers are able to involvement? involve them so that there's there's a whole kind of training piece and then the third thing that we haven't mentioned yet really important for us to evaluate the impact Absolutely. there is some evidence to suggest that public involvement in health research improves the outcomes of health research but we want to be making sure that we're doing that so that we can feed it back into the whole strategy you don't want it to just be a, a busy exercise exactly. yeah no. right how do we train people because I notice on your website you do there, there is a kind of training mm -hmm. component uh, for Patient Voices Network, yeah. yes. So as a person who wants to be part of this network, when you identify yourself to them, they will put you through an orientation process. And yes. Then you become what's known as an activated patient. An activated, <laughs> an activated patient. Um, <laughs> and there are about 500 of us around yes. the province yes. um, who are prepared. And, and then we get emails telling us about opportunities to meet with healthcare partners Oh. And as again, in various capacities, focus groups, panels, committee work. Yes. There's just a, an amazing array of Are people, are, do we have keeners? Are people, oh, yeah. are the people keen? <laughs> <laughs> you. Yes, absolutely. We yeah. just need to remove a few barriers and then I think like. people will be. Well, um, time. I, I think that one of the biggest ones is I don't want to be a token representative here. I want uh -huh. to know that what I say is actually going to make a difference. Have you had to weed out any nuts? <laughs> <laughs> because you're going to get people, you're going to get people who want to participate, but their 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 motor you know, mouths or they, yeah. they have you know or they have specific causes yeah. that yeah they have specific for. causes yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That I think to be dealt with yeah. Yeah. for sure and I, th I think that speaks to two things one is uh, there's a fear that people have yes. about involving patients because they think that's what's going to happen right yes. someone is going to come and just sit there and go my on daughter said yes yeah. exactly yeah. Yeah. and they're not really interested in seeing the the whole picture but yes. that the other issue then is the training or the orientation and uh, that you provide to people who want to participate as the patient voice or as the public voice and talking about these issues like you know it is important story is important we're told over and over and over again story is really important story is always important but you have to be able to generalize but there's but, but the, story. story is important but there's a giant danger in narrative you know, I mean, I'm a therapist, so I, can't, I right. often tell right. clients, would you stop with the narrative already? Right. Just tell me what the issue is. I, yeah. I don't want to hear he said, she said, we said, yeah. you yeah. know, I don't want to hear all that. Yeah. But it, but it does have to go both ways. Yes, so, it has to, So absolutely. patients of the public have to be trained and, and sure. oriented on how to interact, and then researchers and health care providers I'm and assuming, everyone on that end. I'm assuming we've got about 40 seconds left. I'm assuming that you folks are, are, are happy with where this is going. You're getting oh, good response. Excited. Really, really yeah. excited. Uh, yeah. Happy to have support from the government for, for this kind of initiative and, yes. from, and uh, for, you know, there's lots in, in place in BC to build on. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, both of you. Thank thank marvelous you. what you're doing and marvelous. Thanks for the opportunity. Report it. Okay. Thank you. So, folks, that's uh, almost it for today. Next week, Jeff Keithley is going to be here and he is... Um, so I forgot where it is. Oh, he's up in the Sunshine Coast, and he's created BC Ferries, bcferrycoalition.com, 
and he's up in arms about how uh, the Corp is cutting back on ferry service. Before we leave you, look, somebody left us uh, on Monday. He was 94 years old. I'm going to start crying. He's one of my heroes. He was 94. His name was Pete Seeger. He was a great, great singer, composer, but activist. He almost single-handedly saved the Hudson River. He lived on, along the Hudson River, and a dear friend of mine, uh, uh, worked with him and sailed with him along the Hudson River. Um, and so what we're going to show you is, a, you, he's the guy with the banjo on the far side of what you're going to see. This is a little minute of a huge uh, concert, the 25th reunion uh, uh, concert at Carnegie Hall of the Weavers. I worked with Ronnie Gilbert, she's the lovely lady singing. I worked with her once, I saw her acting in the Sam Beckett play. She's magnificent. These folks really changed the world, and this is the guy who, who did We Shall Overcome and, and, and Good Night Irene and so on. So, um, with tears in our eyes, goodbye to and thanks to Pete Seeger. Good night, Irene, I'll see you in my dream. Will I love Irene? God knows that I do. I love her till the seas run dry But if Irene turns her back on me I'm gonna take morphine and die